post it. Uh, I have such a sinus headache today. It's, it's crazy. I, I, I just, you know, normally I have office hours at 8, but I just got here, and it's like, oh. But I'm feeling a lot better, believe it or not, than I did an hour ago. And an hour ago, I was, I was, I was debating if I was even going to make it in. But uh, I'm here. I wouldn't want to disappoint anyone. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to continue looking at CSS layout, and, and we're going to uh, gradually make it more and more flexible. Um, there's a lot of advantages to layouts that are flexible. They're, uh, they're uh, adaptable to the size of the screen, largely. And that has some important implications when we talk about mobile development. All right. The thing to remember, too, a couple things to remember, is that we're not going to do this in one giant leap. All right. There are degrees of flexibility in CSS layouts. Uh, the kind of layouts that we looked at last time were uh, very fixed layouts. Everything was like locked down, nailed down into exact positions. That's about you know as fixed as, as they come. And and those are called uh, those are sometimes called you know in slang terms ice layouts because they're like frozen in place. Keep in mind that when we talk about these things, these are more like descriptive terms than like official classifications, you know. Like I've had students ask me, is this a liquid layout? It's like, well, you could call it that or you could call it a, you know, it has characteristics of both. It's less important to like be able to like give an exact name than to sort of understand the ideas behind it. The one thing that just popped in my head right now that we did not talk about is the, the overflow attribute on something. So let's spend a few minutes talking about that before we go into uh, more flexible layouts. So let me pull up the page from last time. So look, I think this is the one I'm, I'm interested in. Or not. Oh, I ain't opening it. Oh. Yay. Now I'll get like six copies of it, probably. <laughs> All right. So, for example, right here, and again, this brings up an important point. Right here, if you notice, we're going to look at this guy mainly. <clears throat> it's that tall. And coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, it matches exactly the content. All right. How did it match the content exactly? Maybe I'm maybe I'm not being vague, but, but, yeah, or maybe I'm being I am being vague. Yeah, right. Is it a fall height? In other words, if we did not put a height on something, all right, it get it, it'll be as as tall as it needs to be. All right. So in this case. These are two divs. They both have the same style applied to them, or they both have similar styles applied to them, rather. Uh, and this one's this big, this one's that big. And the reason for that, again, is because I've, I've not defined a height. And that's one thing that's important um, to realize, is that sometimes you do not need to uh, micromanage the CSS. Sometimes you don't need to control every single attribute of it. Let the browser do its thing. Sometimes, sometimes that actually, you know, there's the old, uh, there's the old expression, less is more. All right, and and sometimes if you the, the let, you know, if if you let the browser do its thing for a few things and you control the things that are important, you can get an effective layout a little bit easier. Let's go and let's put a height on that div. All right, so let's go into the CSS file and open it up in Notepad, and I will give a height of this div of three hundred pixels. All right. When I do that, notice what happens is it sort of leaks outside of, of the div. Now there's a couple ways that we can handle that and, and approach that if we want to give a height. One way we can do it is we could give a minimum height on both of these. I'm going to say instead of height, I'm going to say min height. So I'll actually do this on both of the divs this time.
All right. And notice what it did. That first div, or the first div is, is, is again as big as it needs to be because I said 300 pixels is a minimum height. If it needs to be more, it can make it more. The second div is doesn't quite fill up the 300 pixels, so it gets the minimum height of 300 pixels. So you can use a min height. Uh, sometimes will help. The other thing that you can do is, and I'll leave the second one with a min height. If I put a height, I can specify specify overflow. All right. Now, overflow is one of those that I never remember the the values of it, so I'm going to have to look that up. Nah, no spoilers. No spoilers. Right. I, uh, I, 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 I deliberately look it up, and, and, and I deliberately look it up and, and, uh, for, for a couple reasons. First of all, um, I, I think it's an important thing to, to realize that you're, you're not going to remember or know everything. You know, it, 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 at, least, at least for me, it's impossible to know all these things just at the top of my head. Uh, you know, I know the things that I do a lot. All right. I typically don't play with the overflow attribute. So therefore, I know there is an overflow attribute, and I can look it up if I need to. That's just about as good as knowing it off the top of your head. You know, the great thing about web development is there's so many good uh, resources out there where you can quickly look things up, and you need to get in the habit of doing that. But that doesn't mean that you wing everything, right? Because you know, you, you need to know where to look, and you need to know sort of the terminology and the concepts so that you, your search won't be looking for a needle in a haystack, but you'll at least know which haystack you're looking for the needle in or, or something like that. One of the options for overflow is scroll. And so what I can do is put on this overflow of scroll. And then what we get is this. We got a scroll bar. So we can go and do that. Uh, that's a nice way to concisely put something um, on a page, but still be flexible enough so that, hey, if there's more than it, uh, you, can, you can go. One thing that people ask about sometimes is, uh, how do I get columns even? Well, this gives you one way of doing that. Right? It's very difficult through CSS. You've got to go through a little bit of hoops to, to make columns truly even, uh, no matter what. But by using the overflow, you can sort of, you can sort of get that uh, effect and not run the risk of, of cutting stuff off or having stuff leak off the, the end, of, uh, end of it. What are some of the other options for that? All right, visible, hidden, scroll, auto, and inherit. So let's go and put visible. Visible is the default, so it'll be like it looked before. So we see it, and but it goes off the off the background of the container. Probably isn't good. We've done scroll. We could do hidden. Cuts it off part way through. Um, I don't. I, yeah, I'm trying to think under uh, circumstances under which I would want to do that, but you can. All right, that, that's a good thing. Oh, they actually gave a good example of that. They they gave an example, I think, in the book of having thumbnails. And if you had a, a bunch of thumbnails, you could uh, on a on a, on a, a, a you made the percent. Uh, Instead of making it an absolute number, you made the, uh, the, the width a, a percentage. You could get as many as you wanted to, and then you could cut off the bottom row of thumbnails uh, or something like that. I believe that's in the book. I, I saw that example recently, so I, I'm pretty sure it's in, it's in our textbook. 
And the other one is auto. And that's going to look a lot like the scroll. The difference being that if I put this one on, The difference will be apparent when I look at this when we look at this one. Maybe. Alright. Auto says add a scroll bar if you need it. As opposed to scroll says have a scroll bar there regardless. So, of the two, I, I, I guess I would typically go with the auto as opposed to the scroll. That way you don't see the, the unsightly scroll bar unless you really need it. And, you know, and uh, you only see the scroll bar that you need. So, if there's not a need for a horizontal scroll bar, you won't see that. Um, yes? So, with our project, um, say we do this wireframe and the lines look like that, but then as you're developing the page, you know, one column is longer than Well, that's a good question, and you get that. Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. And, and the question is, what happens? Let, let me paraphrase the question. What happens through the course of development if I decide I want to change something that's in the plan? And your question was specifically about the wireframe and, and all that. And but in this question, I, I guess, um, I guess, uh, um, you know, is is true for almost any part of it. You know. I may in my prototype decide I want green and white as my colors. When I'm developing it, I look, it's like, you know, I don't really like that color green. Uh, maybe I should make it a, a dark blue instead. You know, so it's anywhere from superficial changes to more substantive changes. And first of all, keep in mind that a plan is a plan, right? If I was planning to drive to Columbus, I might think of going down uh, 90 to 58, 58 south to something, then get on 71 and go there. But if I heard that, say, there was a big accident on 71 at a certain thing, uh, and I was driving, I might then take a detour and go a different way or whatever. So I've deviated from my plan because of that. You don't stick to your plan just because you made your plan. All right? Um, your plan is just that. It's a plan. It's It's a way of thinking through the problem before you approach it. But the further you get on in the project, the more you know about what the needs and, and the more you know about the project, the further on you go. So uh, it, it is beneficial then if you see something that needs change to go ahead and change it. All right. Now, the hope is that you're not like totally changing it 100%. Like, oh, I'm driving to Columbus? Wait. I needed to be in Detroit. You know, <laughs> that's kind of bad when that happens. And believe it or not, sometimes that does happen, and you just you gotta play with the cards you've been dealt, as they say. But the hope is is that you're you're not necessarily changing things too great, but you're you're tweaking them. You're taking a little bit different route. So that's okay. And for the purposes of this class, you wouldn't necessarily need to go back and change the wireframe and all that. Those are sketches. Those are plans. You know, think of uh, of an artist that 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 draws something or sketches something before they paint it or uh, a student doing a, uh, an outline before they do the term paper. The goal isn't to make the best outline in the world. The goal isn't to make the best sketch in the world. The goal is to make the best painting in the world or, or a, a great painting, let's put it that way. The goal is to make a great paper. All right. So therefore, it's okay to deviate with a plan and, and if it's sort of minor changes, you don't even necessarily need to go back and revise the plan. So to answer your question, yeah. You, you do what you think is best at that point of the project. And it's natural that the further along you go in the project, the more you know about it, maybe something comes to light that, that you didn't think of before or whatever. Uh, so yeah, uh, adjust the plan, absolutely. You know, There's no sense saying, hey, I said I was going down 71. 
I don't care if there is a pre presidential motorcade that's going to block traffic for four hours, which I got trapped in a vice presidential motorcade on Monday, all right, coming back from my evening class. I, I, I wonder, it's like, why is there traffic so bad on... Yeah, that, that's what someone told me. I'm like, why is the traffic so bad on 90? And, and they're like, oh, yeah, Biden's in town. It's like, yeah, that's right, that's right. But at any rate, um, there's no sense sticking to the plan if, if you know that you can do better, I guess is that. Yes? Not, not that I'm aware of. The, the, the best you could do, you could, you could possibly write something like that in JavaScript. But that would kind of be a pain. Uh, yeah, there's, it, I wish, but no. No, nothing like that. I'm thinking any solution a lot even close to that would require JavaScript. Other questions or comments? I hope that answered your question. Yeah. All right. Um, so where were we with this? Let me go and let me change both of these to auto. Because if I was going to do any scrolling, that's probably what I would do. Again, your, your mileage may vary. Now, I'm going to try to play with the screen resolution of this, and I'm not sure how it's going to show up on the projector. So this is how it looks on this size screen, this screen resolution. Let's look and see what this screen resolution is. <coughs> it's 1024 by 768 pixels. Let's make the screen resolution... 800 by 600. All right, and okay. Oops. Notice how it looks now. It goes outside of the page, and you have to scroll. Scrolling is not completely evil, but um, vertical scrolling is preferred to horizontal scrolling. All right, so if I make it smaller, my page that fits nicely on uh, my original resolution doesn't fit quite so nicely now. All right, let's make, let's make a, a different screen resolution. All right. I guess that doesn't look too bad, but notice how it's starting to look like there's a lot of wasted space here. There's a lot of space over, over there and all that. Now let me set this back up to where we were originally, and then, then we can talk about it. The one thing that, that's tough for people to get used to in web development at first is the fact that you really have no control about how the user is viewing your page. Right? All you know is that they have a web browser. That's it, all right? You don't know if they're viewing your page on a, uh, uh, on a, on a Mac, on a PC, on a Linux system, um, using Internet Explorer, using Firefox, using Safari, using Google Chrome. You don't know if they have a little tiny monitor that they bought at a garage sale or a gigantic big screen projection thingy, all right? You don't know if they're viewing it on their phone, on their Nintendo DS, on their PS3. You don't know anything about how they're viewing your web page. All right? Yet, you want your page to look good. All right? That's the challenge of web development. Uh, you know, as, as the cliche goes, or as the, the joke goes, that's why we get the big bucks. Right? Is we have to be able to write stuff that works, even though we don't know details about the circumstances of that. So, the drawback of the fixed is, let, let's talk about the, the respective advantages and disadvantages of a fixed layout. The big benefit of it is we can really like nail it down. And we can get it 
locked down and get it exactly the way we want it to look. That's like the good news. The bad news is, is that the size of it is wildly going to look different depending on the screen resolution. Um, so what do you do? Well, one thing that you can do is you can sort of code to the least common denominator. I would imagine the smallest m width that anyone would be using these days on a screen would be like 600 pixels. Ah, that is if we're talking about computers, not if we're talking about mobile devices. All right, because with mobile devices, again, it gets the monkey wrench thrown into it. Um, there is, uh, you know, this is this this has been a, an issue. This is uh, an issue that's arising, and it's an issue that's only going to get uh, bigger. Um, estimates I've seen. Uh, are something, and, and these statistics are very hard to gather, so you'll hear, you know, it, it's like presidential polls. You'll hear totally uh, different, uh, different numbers as far as this goes. But um, the statistics I've heard is approximately 10% of many websites' traffic comes from mobile devices. And is that number going to be going up or is it going to be going down? It's going to be going up, all right? So the size and how it's going to look is sort of a critical issue. So in, uh, as a result of that, fixed layouts are sort of becoming less popular than they were because you, you get those, those issues of looking uh, different sizes on different size screens are magnified when you throw mobile devices into the mix. All right? You can nail it down and you can get it that exact precise layout and everyone's going to see that layout. It's just for some people it's going to go off their screen, for some people it's going to be tiny and on the corner of their screen. All right? So, what do you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can code to the least common denominator, at least the least common denominator that, that you think. You know, you could, you could code something uh, to like a 600 width screen. And that will handle most of your desktops, but that won't handle uh, mobile devices. So that's when we start looking into um, more flexible layouts. All right, more flexible layouts. Um, where we don't use width based on an absolute number, but we use width based on percentages. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to create a, uh, a layout that looks like this. Let me sketch it out first. I'm a, I'm a big fan of sketching out things before you code them. And, and again, sometimes students are resistant to this. Um, keep in mind, again, the sketch doesn't have to be perfect, but the sketch needs to be to demonstrate things to people so that people can easily see it. You know, I could take 50 minutes to come up with a design and say, do you like that? Or I could sketch it out on a sheet of paper and, or on a napkin in three minutes and, and, and ask you if, if you have it and at least sort of have an idea. So at any rate, Here's what my goal is, and we're going to do this. I want a page that to start out with, again, the problem with fixed is on a big screen, the page is going to look tiny, and I over-exaggerate, on a little screen, it's going to go off the boundaries of the page and there's going to be scroll bars. All right. So, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a fixed width. At least to start. We might go and, and monkey around with it later and change it a bit. But I'm going to make that a fixed width. And I'm going to adjust these margins so that this is always centered. I'm going to put a nice background pattern on there so people that have a big old monitor won't think that they've wasted their money. At least they'll see something. <laughs> All right. And it'll look nicer and, and, and so on. So I'm going to put a background image there. And then I'm going to have this so that when I make the screen bigger or smaller, that width stays constant, but what changes is the size of the margin. Sometimes there'll be less margin, sometimes there'll be more margin. 
all right, depending on the size of the screen. So this, um, this you could call a Jello uh, model because, like Jello, it moves a little bit, but it's not splashing all over the place. When we, when we look at liquid layouts, we'll, we'll contrast this one with a liquid layout, whereas as you as you resize the screen, stuff actually flows around the page. All right. So let's go in and let's let's do this. Now. So far, I've been doing all this without touching the HTML. All right, the difference between my, my two files here, position and position one, is simply that position points to position.css and position one points to position one.css. I'm going to make a slight change to the HTML in this example. All right, in this new example. <coughs> Let's go in here, and this will have the same starting point as position one does. So this page is going to look the same as position one to start. All right. And again, if you remember this from this time, we could tighten up the CSS a little bit. We'll do that in a second. Now, what I'm going to do in the CSS for this one you know you, that should have waited like 10 seconds to where I was thinking about something. That would have, that would have provided a nice, a nice sound effect. That's all right. It happens to me sometimes. I'm going to remove all the positions from this to start. Because again, these are absolute positions, and, and we want to get away from that in this example. So I'm going to move, get rid of all the positions. And this is what we have. Let me go in. Let me get rid of everything that deals with position. So now I have that, which is close this on the screen is close to our goal of this, right? Because there I have my big old box, my big rectangle here, and that's close to what I drew. The difference is, is that this at this point doesn't move. It doesn't stay centered. All right. Now, I'm going to make a little change to the HTML here to, to, to put us in a better position to do that. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a container div. All right. Now, we talked about divs before, and divs are a pre HTML5 tag. And a div in prior versions of HTML was sort of your all-purpose grouping tag. All right. Now we have specific kinds of grouping tags, right? We have a header tag where we group everything that belongs in the header. We have a nav tag that groups everything that's in the navigation. We have an article, we have a, a section tag. 
Is that correct section or should that be article? Yeah, it is section. Right. What did what, what was the tag I made up last week? Content? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I looked at that as like, is that the one I made up? No. No, we're, we won't make up any tags today. But a section, again, sort of relates to a section of the page. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to make a div that I'm going to call my container div. And I'm going to give it an ID of container. And now, everything in the page is part of that container div, right? That's going to help me when I get to do this, right? When I get to center this in here. That's going to help me because I don't have to worry about centering each individual thing. I only have to worry about centering the container div, all right? So... This is simplifying my life. And in fact, sometimes even if I'm not planning on using it, I'll put the container div in there just in case I plan on doing it. If you don't put any style associated with it, there's you know, really no impact of it. Uh, well, you, you have it wrap around the top and the bottom. All right. So in other words, all the content is in there. All right. So let's go in here, and I'm going to make the container div I'm going to give a background, or let's make the width 600 pixels. And let's give a background color of yellow or orange. We don't really see the background color, right? Let's do this then. Let's give it a background of white. This is what I wanted to do. I just didn't know I wanted to do it until I saw that that didn't do what I thought it was going to do. And let's give the body a background of orange. So notice what we got. We have the body has a background of orange, and everything that's in my container div, which is all my real content, um, has a, uh, a background of white. All right, so we're getting there, right? Because what we have now, in fact, we can even do this if we want. Let's put a border around this guy. Just thinking, maybe this is how some of those bad web pages that you found had. They were an instructor demonstrating things with just wild colors, and one of their students didn't get the idea that you're not supposed to use those kinds of colors. And so maybe I just just thought of that. Okay, so there we go. We have this border around it, and and, and all that. So we're kind of at there. We're kind of at this. All right, we got our container with our stuff inside of it. The only thing that we don't have is it's still sort of a nice layout. In other words, as I move that, nothing happens. All right. What we have to do is we have to make the margin adjust itself so that this stays centered. All right. So we want, this mar we want this to stay centered by adjusting the margin, all right? And the way I can do that is by saying on my div, 
margin 0 px auto. Save that. And now what we have is what we aimed for. All right. So I make it small, it stays centered. And it goes back and forth. So again, this isn't truly liquid. In other words, that, that intersection always stays 600 pixels. So it's not like radically changing its form. But like Jello, it wiggles a little bit. All right, as I go here, boom, back and forth. All right. Now, to sort of complete this, I put a green border on there just uh, so that the border would stand out. Let's go and change that border to black. And I know I'm, I'm off a pixel or two here or there because I, I, as I was doing this, I wasn't thinking in terms of the padding and margin and all that. So I'm off a little bit on that. My head hurts too much to fix that. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to find a nice little background image and we're going to put it behind there. Now, we could use a big old background image, you know, if we wanted to. Uh, or we could use a small background image that tiles. All right. Now, tile background images, what they are is they're symmetric. All right. So in other words, if you flip them any direction, they're the same. So therefore, they line up. It's just like if you could buy, like, uh, tile squares. Uh, for, for, for a room, or if you buy, you know, uh, uh, wallpaper or something. Yeah. It, they have a certain pattern that repeats. And, oh, you know, I remember my dad trying to wallpaper things and getting the pattern to match and all that. It's a lot easier uh, in web development. Let's go out and let's look for, let's look for a web page tile background image that we can oh title background tile background all right um Okay, lots of patterns to be downloaded below, and I'll remember to copy the source to put it on that. Let's see, what do we like? Um, use this pattern, credit me, we will. Uh, is there a link to download? All right, they give a whole bunch of different patterns here. Let's extract all these. And I'll put them on the desktop in a folder called Patterns. Then we can look at these guys. Right now I'm going to go and put this on my page so the FBI doesn't burst in. Can look and we can pick the one that we like. All 
I like this one. Notice if we look and we were to edit this, this is a hundred, oh, this is like a hundred by a hundred. And if you notice, you might have to look real close, the way it is is if this gets tiled, this guy over here is going to line up with that guy over there. This corner is going to line up. It, it will look and it will make a consistent big pattern. So I'm going to go and copy this into my folder. And it's called, go and make sure we show the file extensions so we know exactly what it's called. I'll go in my CSS and I'll give it a different background. Instead of a background of a color, I'll give the background of a URL. I think that should do it. And no, it didn't. No. There we go. It was the space that did it. All right. And kind of looks nice. Nice thing about this is because even though it's a big, uh, you know, it covers a lot of space, um, that's still a small image because it's only 100 by 100. It's downloaded once and the browser simply tiles it. It's not like it has to download each of the tiles individually. You could put a big image behind it, you know, a big giant image behind it, but then it would be downloading a big, big image and, and, and that, could, that could take time. And again, the nice thing is, is as we make it bigger or smaller, whoops, that slides. But again, it stops here because we've given it a width. All right. Questions about this? You'll see a lot of web pages that look like this, that, that follow this very uh, general template. Now, um, I think I've alluded to this in class before. You know, sometimes maybe maybe since I started video recording my classes, um, you know, you tend to think of them as little mini movies. So, as any Hollywood producer knows these days. You don't just make a movie, right? You try to have a franchise. And, and how do you have a franchise? By setting up sequels, right? So I'm going to try to set up next Monday's sequel, all right? We did this, and this is fine and good. We did, we did what we said we were going to do by creating that layout. <coughs> it matches our wireframe, all right? What if I want it to look like this. What if I want it to look like this? I want the same sort of thing where I have a container div, which is all my content, that's centered on the page. So that as I resize it, those margins adjust back and forth. But, in this example, I just had one thing after the other. I didn't do anything with the position of those divs, right? I just let the browser just display them, bloop, down the line. Let the browser do its job. Didn't try to micromanage it. Now, I want to do this. I want to make it so I have my banner. I have my navigation this way. And I want my content area over here. Now, we 
We've done that with a fixed layout, right? That was the first layout that we did, if I remember right. More or less, all right? Banner, navigation, content area, all right? So we did it with this, but what was the problem with this? It was fixed. All right. I want the same thing to happen, but I want this block that contains everything to stay centered. So as I resize it, it adjusts itself like this. Except I want the banner, the navigation, and the content area. All right. Can I do it the same way as I did the first example? You kind of got to think the answer is no, otherwise I wouldn't be making this big a deal about it, right? <laughs> so no, I can't do it. Why can't I do it the same way as I did the first example? Right. Right. In the first example, everything was nailed down in position. So when I re we resize the window, nothing's going to move. That's not going to work if I want to lay out similar to this where everything moves. So I can't do it with, a fixed, with, with fixed positioning. But I want something like fixed positioning. All right? I also obviously can't do it the way I did this way. Why not? Well, if I did it the same way I did this one, then it would already be done. Right? We'd, we'd, be, we'd be on our way and we'd be playing Angry Birds or something. All right? So I can't use this same technique because this technique where I just let the browser position the stuff inside that container div does just like we did the first week of class where, boom, we have a flow. So there obviously has to be another method altogether of, of doing that. And at this point is where part one ends and part two will be Monday. It's a cliffhanger. All right, we'll see you up in lab.